Our speaker today is Dr. Nikki Moore. Nikki is a visiting professor at Pomona College near Los Angeles, but she was a member of the Pacific Northwest chapter while getting her master's at Western Washington University and her PhD at Oregon State. Nikki's main research interests focus on mafic igneous rocks, but she's also fascinated by the information that geoscientists can glean from indigenous narratives, which is the topic of her presentation today. So go ahead, Nikki. Thank you, Marcia, for the introduction. And good afternoon to everyone. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here today. And I'm really excited to talk to you about the subject of geomythology. Um, I'm going to first dive in by giving you some sense of how I came to be discussing such a topic. As Marcia pointed out, this is not my area of expertise. I have studied basalts in a variety of tectonic settings with a mind to um, finding out their mantle sources and crustal history. So this is a, a divergence for me. Um, I finished my PhD at Oregon State in 2018 and immediately moved to Claremont um, to teach at Pomona College. And upon arriving here, I heard about this um, course called Critical Inquiry Seminar that all of the incoming freshmen take. It's this interdisciplinary course and it's an approach to giving them skills, learning thoughtful inquiry via reading, writing, and discussion. So skill building rather than knowledge base. And it's taught by faculty across the colleges. So each flavor, each course of ID1, each section has a little bit different flavor depending on who's teaching it. And I immediately thought, how cool, I wanna teach that class. And so what would my flavor be? And I thought it'd be great to incorporate my own interdisciplinary studies. As an undergraduate, I minored in Native American studies. And I knew of a few geomyths, I wouldn't have titled them that um, a few months ago, but that gave geologic insights, right? I knew about the Cascadia 1700 myth examples and Pele um, links to Hawaiian eruptions, but I thought there must be many more. Little did I know, this is a well-developed subdiscipline of geology. So just want to give you a caveat to start off right away. I'm far from an expert in this subject. I consider myself a student of geomythology. And so here I'm summarizing for you some, only a small bit of what I've learned in the last six months of basically literature review and developing this particular course. So my goals here are to give you an overview of how geomythology has developed, provide worldwide and Pacific Northwest specific examples of these geomyths and the imagery that they contain about geologic processes. And for some of these examples, demonstrate how peer reviewed research has been conducted to glean geologic data from these geomyths, touch on a few historical and literary concepts that are inherent to myths, and then finish off by summarizing ways of how merging Western science with indigenous knowledge can be mutually beneficial. So let's all get on the same page about what geomythology is exactly. Here's a definition for you. It's the study of narrative traditions, whether oral or written, that have been created by indigenous cultures throughout human history and explain geologic phenomena. So they they explain earthquakes, floods, fossils, volcanoes, or the origin of those processes. So maybe exact events of these different geohazards, or maybe the origin of a geologic phenomenon or um, something specific to the landscape. So these myths are answering the question of why geologic processes occur for those indigenous belief systems. These myths are often fantastic, if you will, involve supernatural beings and lots of descriptive metaphor that are really focused on each indigenous um, culture, the, their cultural concepts. I wanna point out here that how I'm defining myth and how folks that study geomythology define myth is specific to the non-derogatory version, right? The definition of myth here is a traditional story that explains the early history of a people, their natural or their social phenomenon, and it contains topics of import to them. It's felt to be true by the believer, so it's part of their religious belief systems. I'm not referring to myth in that sense, that second definition, that it is a false or widely held belief, like an urban myth, right? Um, and that's the use here in, in the discipline. Also, there are lots of other terms, legends, folklore, that people will argue about, semantics, what those individual terms mean, um, and how you distinguish them is largely based on the attitude of the, the teller towards that tale, but I'm not gonna distinguish those. Let's focus in on myths as an all-encompassing term. 
it's absolutely a very interdisciplinary discipline. So not only is um, mythology and geology involved, but of course, ar archaeology, human history, comparative mythology, sometimes biology and chemistry, the various sciences to understand how some of these processes affect human cultures. And then another thing that I want to point out to you, and I will continue to do so along the way, because it was something that was hard for my brain to wrap around for a while, is there are basically two types of geomyths. There are etiological geomyths that explain the presence or the origin of some kind of geologic phenomenon. So those are explanatory. And then there are euhemeristic geomyths. Those give accounts of an actual historical event. So I'm calling those descriptive. That's how I distinguish them in my own mind. So I'm showing you an image here at the top right of Torgatten in Norway. That's the name of this little mountain. It means hat. And it, Norse myths involve giants in a lot of cases. They see these big landscape features and they want to attribute, attribute them to involvement of giants. And the, the myth that surrounds this particular feature is that an evil giant fell in love with a giantess, but she already had given her heart to her prince, a different giant. The evil giant got upset and wanted to kill her as a result, right? And if I can't have you, nobody can. So he shot an arrow at her, but her prince, the one that she was in love with, threw his hat to intercept the arrow. Well, the hat landed here and the hole in the center of that feature then is the result of the arrow piercing it. Okay, so that would be an example of an ideological geomyth. It's explanatory, it explains the presence of this feature. As opposed to euhemeristic geomyths, which focus on maybe a particular eruption, like a, a fissure eruption at Kilauea. And that name is attributed, it comes from Euhemerus, who was a philosopher in the fourth century BC and was the first to um, put forth this idea that mythological tales really can be attributed to historical persons and events, albeit maybe altered and exaggerated over time. So now I'd like to give an important nod to the woman who led the development of modern geomythology, Dorothy Vitaliano. I sadly couldn't find a lot of biographical information about her. So I'm gonna give you the information that I do have and here's listed her education. She spent the, the bulk of her career as a geologist with the USGS in Bloomington, Indiana. She was actually a translator. She took a lot of geophysical papers from across the world in different languages and translated the abstracts. She spent the bulk of her career doing that, but she was also a junk faculty at Indiana University. And in 1967, she gave a colloquium at Indiana University about the myth of Atlantis and how it's potentially tied in to um, the late Bronze Age eruption of Santorini, which is something that she had been studying with her husband, Charles, who is also a geologist. So she gave this um, colloquium in 1967. In the audience was a member of the Indiana University Press, and he suggested to her that she write a book on Atlantis. But she said, you know, there's a lot of books already out there on Atlantis. I could do something more general about the connection between geology and myth. So she first wrote a paper um, that summarized that colloquium in the Journal of Folklore Institute in 1968. And that's where she first coined the term geomythology. Then a few years later, she wrote this book, Legends of the Earth, Their Geologic Origins in 1973. This became one of the cornerstones of my organizational structure for the critical inquiry seminar that I developed. She lays out landform myths, earthquake myths, um, volcano myths. There's a, a couple of chapters on Atlantis. So um, looking through those sh short examples that she provides in summary led me to lots of other literature and really helped me frame how I was gonna structure my course. So I can't say enough good things about her. Let's jump ahead. 30 years later, after, after the publication of her book, there was a session at the uh, Florence Italy International Geologic Congress in 2004 on myth and geology. Dorothy presented the keynote address there. And then a few years later, 
a lot of the people who spoke in that symposium pulled together papers that were published as this volume, Myth and Geology, by the Geological Society of London in 2007. So this was the first ever collection of peer-reviewed geomythology papers. Certainly not the first of the papers. Many had appeared before that. Many studies had appeared before that. But this was the first collection. And this was also central to my organization around this topic because it covers a range of myths that pertain to hazards, processes, and products all over the world, as well as these discussions about historical and literary perspectives, which were so important to my discussions with my students in this course. So that's the history as I know it of geomythology and how it's recently developed. Now I'm gonna dig in to some worldwide examples for you and we'll start with earthquake origin myths. But I'll note here right off at the beginning that etiological myths, so those explanatory geomyths are most abundant throughout the globe and are the most recognizable. Some of that imagery is really clear. Um, the origins of earthquakes is an example. So not explaining one particular earthquake event, but rather explaining why earthquakes occur at all. Another thing before we really dig in to an example is that an important consideration for mythologists is to understand how myths develop and propagate. So considering that there are so many commonalities among geomyths from across space and time, they look into whether the myths have developed via polygenesis, meaning independently invented myths about similar material, but in different places at different times. So maybe one local event or one local feature triggered the development of that myth, or whether it moves and is developed via diffusion. So one single invention of a geomyth at one location triggered by a specific event or process or landform, and then transmitted to other regions spread throughout different cultures. And certainly there, both of these processes are at work. I'll digress for a minute and, and give flood myths as an example. So not every geologic process occurs across the globe, but floods can occur almost anywhere, right? Along rivers, along the coastlines. So flood myths are pervasive in most cultures. And the biblical flood myth is certainly propagated through diffusion, right? Christian missionaries um, spreading the word of God and, and that flood myth going along with it. But there are examples of polygenesis for flood myths as well so that some of in the Pacific Northwest, some of the myths that include imagery of flooding are certainly reflective of tsunamis. They share elements of that biblical flood story, but have distinctions. So that evidence um, is clear that they are different. I'm going to start off by pointing out the location that I live at now. So I'm in Southern California, as Marcia mentioned, here to the east of Los Angeles in Claremont. That's where the Claremont Colleges are, um, just south of this little call out here. And the map that I'm showing you is um, a land acknowledgement map. You can find this if you're interested at this um, web address that I can also put in the chat later if you like, because you can type in any location in the States and it shows you the native land that you are occupying or that that site occupies. So here in Claremont, I am on Tongva land and very near Akashaman land. And these Southern California tribes, of course, have an etiological myth and explanation for the origin of earthquakes. So in order to pay homage to the native lands on which I'm currently residing and to include native voices in my presentation, which I wanted to include more, but as it turns out, an hour goes really fast when you have a lot to say. Oops, sorry about that, popping ahead. Um, I'm gonna show you this rendition of the turtle story is told by Jackie Tahuka Nunez, a member of the Akashaman Nation. The Tongva and the Akashaman turtle story are both the same story about the origin of earthquake myths. So I'm gonna start this, but I'm gonna jump ahead for the sake of time to do a little bit into the video. Water. Oh, I'm gonna jump around that a lot. It was just earth. Forgive me. Here we go. A long time ago, there was just earth. It was just earth with a lot of water. There was no people, just the earth with water swirling. There were creatures inside, but no land. And creator, as he came from a high place, looked down and he said, there must be land to my wood. But how, how can I put some land on water? 
Just as he was thinking, a big tortoise came to the top of the water. And he looked and he says, hmm, that is what I'm going to use. The creator looked at that turtle and he said, ah, brother, turtle, Baal, you have a great opportunity to do something wonderful for Tamayabut. And the turtle looked at him and he said, what can I do? We want to use the top of your turtle shell for the basis of land. But I need more than just you, little turtle. I need your brothers. And turtle went back and he went and looked for all his brothers. It took a whole day for him to find one brother. And it took him another day to get another brother. And he searched all over the earth until he came up with his six brothers. And they stood before creator and looked at him and said, yes, creator, what is it that you shall have us do? I am going to form land, which we shall call Tamayawood, and later it will be called California. Now, tail to head, head to tail, now come on, right now, put yourself together, there you go, this way, a little bit that way, this way, okay, perfect. That is perfect. Then he reached down in the depths of the ocean, and he brought up some soil, and he planted it right on the backs of the turtle. And he reached up into the heavens and he brought down a piece of straw and he made holes right in the soil. And as the soil received the stick, soon big, huge redwoods grew. They were tall, this tall. And he looked at it and he said, this is good. And then he got his fingerprints and he pushed and wherever he put, a fingerprint, there were lakes. And then he took his fingers and he drew lines through it and there were rivers. And he liked what he had seen. This is good, he said. But then something happened and it wasn't good. The turtles, their backs got heavy. Oh, and they didn't like being the, the bottom of the earth anymore. They were kind of tired. And, and the two top turtles said, I'm going east. And the bottom brother says, I'm going west. Come with us. No, I don't want to go your way. I want to go this way. And the brother says, I'm going to go that way. And pretty soon, they swam in separate directions. And before you know it, boom, there was a tremble. It was the first earthquake that was ever heard. Creator heard what was going on. He came down. He said, Brother Turtles, what are you doing? I told you, you must be still. This is a great honor. You have to agree to be still or we won't have land. The turtles agreed. They thought about it and they said, yes, it is an honor. And they agreed that they would be still for the formation of California. But every now and then they get a little tired and they move just a little bit and you feel that tremor, don't you? So what you're going to do is drum, cover, and hold on. And in my language, in our language, we say it this way. Ama, ama, kota, kota, ya, ya. And that will keep you safe. And that will keep. All right, I'm gonna stop there for the sake of time again. But um, I just wanna point out that there are sort of multiple reasons that I wanted to share this besides putting a native voice uh, in my presentation. So this is one example of an earthquake origin myth. It's explanatory in multiple ways though, right? So earthquakes occur when the turtles get tired. Um, she also explained the origin of the redwoods. There's this clear imagery. There's this conveyance of the importance of their religious beliefs, talking about the creator. There's also this clear performative aspect. Um, and she's adapted the story to reflect contemporary needs. I also wanted to um, segue this into talking about the demonstration of some conservation principles that are inherent to myths. So first of all, there's the expertise principle, and that says that myths are devised and articulated by highly trained and gifted experts. So in many tribes, there was a specific shaman that was devoted to creating these stories and passing them on to other trained experts. It wasn't just a word of mouth thing among uh, the people. 
there's also the performance principle at work here. So myths aren't just relayed, but they're performed via ritual with reinforcing media. You saw that she was in costume. There was a lot of gesticulation and inflection in her voice. She used props, um, you know, so there's a lot of performance involved here and that helps with memory. Also the redundancy principle was at work here. Key aspects of the story are repeated for the sake of memory. So the story of the, the turtle going out and looking for his brothers over a series of days. And the reason I wanna point out these conservation principles to you is that because of all these things, oral traditions are pretty reliable. We think of passing on stories as a game of telephone, right? And they'll change a lot over time. But as it turns out, because of these conservation principles, those stories don't change a lot over time. So as scientists, it's important for us to involve indigenous experts when deconstructing these myths, but also to recognize their reliability. All right, so moving on to another earthquake origin example. The Japanese earthquake origin myths are multiple, but I'll give you two examples. Um, one is that earthquakes are caused by what's called a namazu or a subterranean serpent-like catfish. This, whenever the catfish wiggles, similar to this turtle story, an earthquake is generated. But one of their deities, the Kashima deity, is in charge of controlling this serpent-like catfish. He has charge of what's called a foundation stone and holding the catfish down with it. Another way that the Japanese look at the origin of earthquakes is as a lack of balance between the agents of yin and yang. So the agents of yin and yang are wood, fire, metal, earth, and water. And they believe that whenever fire overcomes water, this imbalance generates earthquakes. So those are just two examples of how Japanese culture views earthquake origins, but that those beliefs have um, become pervasive throughout the culture in the form of some artistic expression as well. These images that I'm showing you are called namazui. These are picture prints that are associated with these earthquake origin myths, and they started to become prolific in the late 1500s and are seen sort of as a way of interpreting earthquakes. They're in, they were in a lot of Japanese homes as sort of an homage and a warding off of earthquakes potentially. So the one in the middle is a, an expression of that uh, idea of the Namazu and the Kashima deity holding down the Namazu with the foundation stone. But this other one, oh, and I wanted to point out also here, so not only is this an, uh, a depiction of the Kashima deity holding down the Namazu, these four other miniature Namazu are representative of four major earthquakes that happened over a 25 year span in the early 1800s. So this particular Namazu was created in the late, uh, in the middle 1800s. Here's another example that shows the change of balance and forces. So the Namazu is on the back of a wealthy man who's regurgitating money all over the working class, these uh, construction workers and laborers. And this idea is that when an earthquake occurs, of course, construction workers, the laborers start to make more money. They're important in the rebuilding of society. So it's this redistribution of wealth, it's rebalancing. Moving on to some other worldwide examples, something near and dear to my heart is the, the Pele geomyths. So I'm going to describe for you the narrative of Pele's arrival on Hawaii and interaction with her sister Hiaka, because this contains both ideological, explanatory, and euhumoristic, descriptive aspects. And the summary that I'm giving you here is um, as summarized by Don Swanson in a 2008 paper that he did interpreting some of the local geomythology in the context of Kilauea eruptions. So the origin of Pele's arrival and, and interaction with her sister Hiaka is summarized thusly. Pele and her sisters arrived in Hawaii at the northeast end, so they landed first on Kauai, and Pele was looking for a home where the ground was hot, but she didn't find that on Kauai. She did, however, meet a man named Lo Hiao, who she wanted for herself but she couldn't settle at Kauai, it wasn't hot enough, so she continued down the island chain, stopping at the various spots along the way, and then found her Goldilocks hot location at the big island. After she got settled on the island of Hawaii, she asked her sisters to go back to Kauai. 
to get Lohia for her. Well, Hiaka is the only one that agreed, but she asked in return that Pele not destroy a favored forest of hers, of Ohilehua, a native tree in Hawaii. Pele was volatile, so Hiaka was worried about her favorite location when she was gone. Pele promised she wouldn't destroy the forest, provided that Hiaka returned in 40 days. So off Hiaka goes to Kauai to retrieve Lohiao. She suffered many misadventures along the way, of course, uh, problems with her canoe, she, she encountered a typhoon, and when she got to Kauai, Lohiao was actually dead, but she revived him and started the journey back to the island of Hawaii had to stop along the way and, and resting on Oahu, she summited a mountain, looked back at the island of Hawaii and saw her beloved forest of fire. Well, she had surpassed her 40 days and Pele got angry thinking that she was off cavorting with Lohiao and set the forest on fire. Hiaka being the uh, de dedicated sister she was, continued on, landed back on the island of Hawaii, summited Kilauea, took Lohia with her, and in full view of Pele, made love to him to anger her. And of course, anger her she did. So Pele killed Lohia and threw his body into the crater. Hiaka then went to dig furiously to recover his body. She kept digging deeper and deeper and rocks are flying everywhere, but she was warned by Pele not to dig too deeply or water would come in and put out the fires of Pele. Sound familiar, recent events? And in the end, Hiaka did finally get back with Lohiao. They are together today, at least in spirit. So I think this uh, longer story is a good demonstration of a lot of different things. One, it demonstrates the, the Native Hawaiians understanding of the progress progressive aging of Hawaii, right? So she moved from Hawaii southeast to where the current active volcanism occurs. Another thing that is evident from the imagery in this story is that perhaps her looking back, Hiaka, looking back at the forest of fire represents a large lava flow. The top image I'm showing you here is of a large lava flow from May of 2018. I can't remember the exact location. Maybe I have that. I just, uh, oh, March of 2011. I'm sorry. So this is a lava flow from near Kilauea in 2011. Forest is a flame, right? Same sort of imagery. So the idea here is that might correspond to the Ilaau lava flow from the 15th century. I'm gonna pop back to this slide and show you a map of Kilauea and the, the surrounding region to the southeast. This lighter gray color is the Ilaau lava flow, which has been dated around 1470 um, CE. That was the end-ish and it's thought to have lasted about 60 years. So similar imagery there. And then also imagery suggestive of the collapse of Kilauea's caldera, right? Yaka digging furiously and chucking up rocks. Well, that really invokes the idea of, of an explosive eruption from the caldera. And in Don Swanson's paper, he mentioned that tephra that mantles the main caldera faults is actually dated to, to 1500 CE. So these two events in close proximity to one another as it, they are in the origin myth. Previously, uh, I don't know for how long, but at least prior to Don's paper in 2008, uh, Kilauea, the collapse of the caldera had been interpreted by some to be 1790, associated with that explosive eruption that generated the ash in which these footprints, these famous footprints in Volcano National Park um, in the ash from that eruption, this army retreating from attacking Kamehameha, that's that same eruption. But um, Don reviewed the writings of a reverend who recorded some geomists from the native Hawaiians and reinterpreted that in context with the other geologic evidence. So he reviewed the writings of, um, of Reverend William Ellis, who was a missionary that was fluent in Hawaiian and he traveled the islands, more interested in the culture as an ethnographer than, than actually converting folks to Christianity. In 1823, he traveled to the summit of Kilauea and the guides that went along with him relayed some oral traditions that indicated the caldera had probably formed generations prior. So this is in 1823, only 30 years after the 1790 eruption, when these guides are saying, no, that caldera formed generations prior. And here's a quote from those writings. Kilauea had been burning from time immemorial and had overflowed some part of the country during the reign of every king that had governed Hawaii. In earlier ages, it used to boil up 
overflow its banks and inundate the adjacent country. But that for many kings reigns past, it had kept below the level of the surrounding plain. So in 1823, these guides are saying it's been many kings reigns past since Kilauea caldera was formed. And so Don Swanson made some assumptions Obviously, we can't accurately date what many kings past means, but he estimated, based on some assumptions, that that could have been maybe 10 to 15 rulers, and that the generations lasted 20 to 25 years. With those ranges, he came up with an estimate of the caldera forming between 1450 and 1600 CE. So rather than the caldera forming hundreds of years after this Isla outflow, it seems that they were actually closely spaced in time. And this is also, as we saw, what's suggested by the Pele oral tradition, albeit we're talking about time compression in these geomyths of a couple of days. One last thing I want to point out about Don's paper is that I really enjoyed it because not only is it a good peer review process of how we can pick apart these geomyths and get geologic information, but he also gives some thoughtful advice on the practice of using these traditions. His quote there and his point is that as scientists, we are really good at answering the what, when, where, and how questions, right? But we can't and shouldn't try to answer the why questions for these indigenous cultures. That's what their belief systems are doing by using these geomyths. So we should really focus on the what, when, and where to get that better understanding of how. That's what our job is as geoscientists in the, the realm of geomythology. So one last worldwide example before I start digging into some Pacific Northwest examples is the Oracle of Delphi, also called Pythia. So she was believed to have divine prosthetic power from Apollo. And in, in ancient Greece, there were several Apollonian temples that had these oracles. The myth that's specific to the Oracle of Delphi is that she was the result of Apollo's conquest of a serpent called Python. Uh, the snake was described in the Homeric hymn to Apollo. The snake was believed to have created earthquakes. So the, the quote goes like this, and this is after Apollo has started attacking the serpent. Python, racked by sore pain, she lay loudly gasping, rolling about the place. An extraordinary hissing arose without measure as she kept writhing this way and that among the trees and quit her spirit with bloody exhalation. So he exulted while darkness covered his eye, her eyes, and there the sun's divine force rotted her down. Hence, the place is now called Pitho. Well, in Greek, Pitho is the rotting process. And this chasm that formed in the place where the serpent was killed is where the Apollonian temple of Delphi occurred. So there's this gaseous vent theory that the oracular process, right, the prophetess, um, was powered by these divine exhalations that emanated from a chasm in the chamber, in the oracular chamber. And as it turns out, the temple sits atop the Delphi Fault. So this gaseous vent theory is a little bit contentious. There are a few schools of thought. One is that potentially along this fault, ethylene is admitted to dramatically alter her mental state. And here's where the biology comes in, right? So biologists can tell us ethylene would alter her mental state. Other ideas are that maybe a different hydrocarbon, methane, ethane, or carbon dioxide induce oxygen depletion, and that causes hallucinations that lead to her prophecies. While there have been measurements at these different temples um, of potential gas emissions, and while there is some indication that there are a, a multitude of gases being em emitted, it doesn't seem like they're constantly emitted. It seems like they're episodically emitted, and maybe that's happening during seismic ruptures. It seems to be encoded in that geomyth, right? From the, the writhing and the rolling about of the place that's suggestive of the serpent causing these earthquakes. Um, and then during those episodic earthquakes, maybe that's when the gases are emitted and she can have her, her hallucinations and prophecies. All right, I'm gonna shift gears and start talking about some examples of geomyths inherent to the Pacific Northwest. These are some of my favorites. 
The Bridge of the Gods is among them along the Columbia River Gorge. So the Klickitat and Multnomah tribes share a myth about there once being a bridge across the Columbia River. And this myth also explains some of the local volcanoes. So um, multiple ideological explanations here. And the summary of that is this. The Great Spirit had two warring sons, Klickitat, also known as Pato, this might be sounding familiar, to the north of the river and Y East to the south. The Bridge of the Gods was created by the Great Spirit as a way for the family to come together. These two sons were constantly warring one another, but it was this bridge literally, literally and figuratively to bring the family together. The brothers kept fighting though. They fought over a beautiful woman named Lewitt and their anger in this fight shook the earth with fire that caused the bridge to fall into the river. And unfortunately, Lewitt couldn't choose between the brothers, but some say that she actually perished in the fighting. As punishment, the great spirit turned his sons into mountains. Klickitat and Pato is now Mount Adams, and Y East is Mount Hood, and obviously Lewitt is Mount St. Helens. So this might be encoding evidence that a bridge once did exist over the Columbia River for some period of time. The Bonneville landslide is here in the tan and sort of brownish colors. Probably a lot of you are familiar with it. This is the south face of Table Mountain right here where the scarp is composed of Columbia River basalts. I had to get my basalts in there somehow. So this landslide once used to be of much larger extent and I've drawn here in red what some references suggest that the past previous extent was. So of course that would have blocked the river and over time maybe the river eroded out part of that landslide and formed a land bridge. This is an image that's actually on the south bridge support of the current bridge of the gods built um, in present times. So perhaps we created this temporary land bridge that collapsed um, once the river partially ca carved through. Another favorite of mine is the origin of Puget Sound and the Cascade Mountains. This is a shared myth among many tribes, the Quinault, the Chehalis, and the Cowlitz included. Um, the, the summary of that particular story is that before rains came to earth, the people who lived east of where the Cascades now stand, suddenly found themselves without water. So for some reason, the groundwater stopped coming to them. A contingent of the people went to visit Ocean and ask him for help. So he sent his sons and daughters clouds and rain. Of course, life improved, the water came back. But the people became really selfish and they wouldn't let clouds and rain return to their father. Well, Ocean got lonely, of course, and kept asking the people to let them return. And he promised the people that if they would, they would have everything they needed in the future. But they kept refusing. They stayed very selfish. Ocean got angry and then asked the Great Spirit to punish the evil deeds of the people. And then, so in response, the Great Spirit scooped up a huge mound of earth and dumped it as a wall between the people and the ocean as this protective barrier from the very selfish people. The mound became the Cascades and the hole filled in with water and became the Puget Sound. And to this day, the myth says that the people east of the mountains are punished because ocean sends little water over the wall. So this is a really fun one in my opinion because if you look at the Cascades and this is an image that I took um, landing in PDX a few years Years ago on my way back to Corvallis with Mount Hood in the foreground, there's Jefferson and the sisters. It looks like a big, I mean, that imagery of a big mound of dirt certainly applies. And then, you know, the gouging of the Puget Sound, uh, it seems absolutely plausible when you look at it from um, the tribal perspective that way. And then it also demonstrates an understanding of meteorological processes, right? The ocean doesn't send water over this wall of the Cascades. All right, so now I'm gonna focus in on some of the myths inherent to the Cascadia 1700 earthquake and tsunami. So we'll also talk about some of the peer reviewed studies that have analyzed these stories. But first I'm gonna give you a sense of the range in the 
imagery from various tribes. There are many, many myths along the Cascadia coast that contain imagery of both shaking, earthquake type imagery, and flooding. One is from the Yurok tribe in Northern California, and their version of the story is that earthquake as a person ran up and down the coast and his heavy feet would shake the ground so much as he ran that it would sink and the ocean poured in. So clearly both earthquakes and tsunamis in that imagery. For the Kwayut and the Ho and many other tribes in and around the Olympic Peninsula, Peninsula the Thunderbird and Whale myth is the predominant story. And this is the one where they both had a terrible fight. I'll give you a, a sort of um, more elaborate example of this story in a little bit. But they, they Thunderbird and Whale fought. That made the mountains shake and the trees got uprooted. The ocean then rose up and covered the land because of all the shaking. And and for the New Channel and the Huayet tribes on Vancouver Island, their version of the Cascadia 1700 earthquake and tsunami is that a person who accidentally kicked a drum during a dance, the tribe was involved in a dance and one of their tribes people accidentally kicked a drum and got what they call earthquake foot. And ever since, every step that he takes then causes an earthquake. So this range of imagery, but all tied in to shaking and or flooding. So there have been several different peer-reviewed geomythological geomytho studies um, on these different stories. And Macmillan and Hutchinson in 2001 tried to correlate these stories stories with geologic and archaeological evidence. So the map that you're looking at was um, redone after their study, but the brown circles show sites of earthquake evidence. The open circles are sites where there are submerged archaeological ruins. And then of course, all these different callouts are just showing that these are locations where various indigenous peoples had their own versions of geomyths associated with shaking and flooding. So these stories that they analyzed in this 2001 study include ones that correlate with the 1700 earthquake, the subduction zone earthquake, but those that also go beyond that. Many are undateable, and I'll show you how dating has been done on these in just a moment, but are seemingly much earlier than just a few hundred years ago. Many of these indigenous nations have been occupying this region for millennia. So many of these stories seem to go well beyond just the 1700 earthquake. So that demonstrates there's been this rich oral record of repeated subduction zone and earthquake and tsunami events. Some are shaking only imagery, some are flooding imagery, some are both. And so some of those flooding only imagery might be from tele-tsunamis, right? So on the Pacific coastline, perhaps those are tsunamis that are coming from elsewhere that are encoded in their myths as well. And then lastly, the study also showed, and I find this interesting, that the catastrophic events did wipe out these villages. So here's four examples of, of sites that were inundated, but that they eventually were reoccupied afterwards. I think that that shows that not only do we have short human memory currently, and particularly in the United States, it feels like right now, with respect to geohazard events and lots of other things, but you know, historically as well. So here's an example of a study that evaluated many different geomyths associated with the 1700 Cascadia earthquake, Ludwin and others in 2005. They analyzed 40 different stories from 32 sources. So some of their sources had multiple versions of the story, but they suggest that the stories that they used are less than one third of those totally known. But they selected their stories based on clarity of imagery, descriptions, and then a range across Cascadia, so a good geographic distribution. And I'm showing you figures from that paper. Here's a map that all of the um, symbols, the big circles, little circles, squares are showing you locations where these stories come from. And though it's not labeled because they had a separate detailed map, the, the numbers, the stories start with one and go to 32 from north to south. They also included this feature, this sort of grid that details the imagery and the motif of the different stories. So some of them included flooding imagery, some of them included both flooding and shaking imagery, some involved the Thunderbird and Whale, some not. So they really did a systematic analysis of these stories and nine of them they felt were useful enough to be dated. That process 
was similar to what Don Swanson did in his 2008 paper on Hawaii in that he, they made some assumptions about generation length, human memory and things like that. So here's some snippets from some of those stories. And I'll give you a sense here of what their assumptions were. A generation to them is um, no fewer than 15 years and no longer than 40 years. So their bracket there was a little longer. They assume that people do not remember events before the age of five and that the maximum lifespan is 100 years. Some of these stories mention flood survivors, um, but those flood survivors were old in the descriptions. And so they assume that an old person is at least 40, which I really take issue with as a 44 year old. But in any case, maybe 300 years ago, <laughs> 40 year olds were old. So here's a few snippets as examples of the stories that they dated. This is not a myth. My tale is seven generations old. So they simply took the seven generations, did their minimum 15 and maximum 40 years and got a range, right? Here's another one. These um, first two are both from Vancouver Island. These stories are from my father's father, born about 1800, about events that took place four generations before his time. So this was recorded in 1964, four generations before grandfather's father. So, you know, about six generations. That's how they got their range for this particular um, deity story. Last one, one old man says, <laughs> so a 40 year old, right? One old man says that his grandfather saw the man who was saved from the flood. And this happened in, this was recorded in 1875. So again, giving these windows of time, all of their estimates from these nine dated stories, the ranges span this interval between 1690 and 1715. And then the average range of the midpoints, so the midpoint of each um, nine dated stories range is 1690. Okay, so there's a lot of plus and minus inherent with these, a lot of assumptions going on, but clearly this is consistent with the geologic findings, right? From radiocarbon dating, from tree ring dating, and from Japanese records. So I think the utility here um, is not only that we can glean new geologic information from geomyths, but that we can also use it as supportive evidence. I wanna dig in just a little bit more deeply into the Thunderbird and Whale tales, just because I find them so intriguing and so you're kind of at my mercy of the things that I find the most interesting. Uh, but there are many versions of, of these stories that are mostly unique to the Cascadia coast. They appear from Vancouver Island all the way south to the northern parts of Oregon. But not only do they encode data about the 1700 earthquake, they also have some etiological aspects. So they explain the features of the natural landscape that the people experienced. And I'm going to show you a Google Earth tour of some sites that come from the Thunderbird and Whale geomythology. This, um, Google Earth Tour is actually compiled by two of my students in the geomythology class. As part of that class, they each teamed up and led a discussion on one of our class days. And so this was compiled by two of my students. I'm going to change my screen share to my browser. Hopefully you can all see that. Somebody chime in if they can't. I once had, um, I was showing the wrong slide in a class for like 15 minutes before one of my students popped up. So <laughs> if you can't see what you think I'm, I'm supposed to be showing, let me know. We can see it. Great. Um, so I'm gonna present here. And so this one is an example of the Ho Glacier being part of the Thunderbird and Whale myth. Thunderbird is thought to reside in a cave up at the highest part of the Olympic Mountains. And so um, one of the recordings of this geomyth says that since the fight, since the major battle between the Thunderbird and the Whale, there has been no timber on the upcountry. And the heap of debris they pulled down was known as the bench. So they're using this myth to explain the absence of timber in the highest parts of the Olympics, as well as this moraine um, along the Ho Glacier. Some other features is that um, they describe all of the different prairies along the Olympic Peninsula 
as locations of the battles. I'm gonna zoom out here because Forks Prairie is one and Beaver Prairie is another that have been alluded to, Taiyi Prairie and many others along with it, um, that these are places where the battles occurred uh, between the Thunderbird and the whale. Um, that they're clearly devoid of timber. That's the reason they're explaining the presence of these prairies from, from the ripping up of the timber during the battles. The next thing I'll point out is that, oh, I'm gonna keep going beyond the prairies. There is a second sort of version of the story, and I'm realizing now that I didn't do a different summary for you. So the Thunderbird and Whale myth as summarized by many of these tribes is basically this, the killer whale resided in the ocean and he was killing off all the other whales. Well, that was terrible for the people because they use whales as a resource, right? So they pleaded with the Thunderbird to take care of the killer whale. Thunderbird acquiesced, went to the ocean, plucked killer whale out of the ocean and was taking killer whale back to her cave in the Olympic mountains, but of course got tired along the way. And so she stopped at a few different locations and every time she she would set the whale down and a terrible battle would ensue. And the whale uh, would attack her. And so that, that's what ripped up these different areas and prairies. A later sort of addition to that is that killer whale had a son named Sebus and he became a problem for the people later as well. So eventually they had to ask Thunderbird to help again. Thunderbird did battle with Sebus as well and finally kill him. She left behind his carcass in this region, creating the bend in the Solduck River. And then finally, I'm gonna zoom back into Thunderbird's home. Again, thought to be a cave in the Olympic mountains. And some parts of these stories encode imagery that seems suggestive of avalanches. So the people say that they don't wanna go near Thunderbird's cave. And they say that if hunters or anyone in the upcountry gets too close, that upsets Thunderbird. And so he rolls ice out of his caves. And yeah, right, sounds very much like an avalanche. Okay, so I'm shifting back to the presentation. Again, let me know if there's any problems with viewing that. So just a good summary of how there is definitely uh, descriptive information and explanatory information encoded in these myths. It's fine, Nikki. Good, thank you. All right, the last example I wanna give you with the last few minutes I have here is uh, the example of Ayahos. So an Ayaho is a serpent spirit, according to many of the Salish tribes, especially up in the Puget Sound region. And we see Ayahos as malevolous and dangerous shapeshifters. Many of the tribes view the Ayaho as a double-headed serpent. Some of them think the Ayaho is a deer in the front with a snake tail in the back. But regardless, the associations are very similar in that Ayahos are associated with shaking and with turbid waters. The people believe that Ayahos, these malevolent spirits, can come either from the sea or from land. And when they do come, the earth gets torn. Okay, so all very clear earthquake and flooding, maybe tsunami related imagery. And these Ayahos myths are actually associated with specific sites. There's another study, a separate Ludwin and all 2005 study that looked at these locations. And here's a modified map of theirs that shows you with the double-headed serpent places where the Ayahos myths are associated with specific sites. And very often there are boulders called spirit boulders at these locations or there used to be that the people associate with the Ayaho. So they, they, they believe these boulders to be animate. They have their own, these Ayaho spirits within them. And the boulders you might be thinking immediately, are, are we talking about glacial erratics? But no, these boulders might be part of landslide material. And most of these Ayaho's myths are associated with sites either along or very near the Seattle fault zone. And three studied in this particular paper were also associated with ancient landslides that the authors looked at LIDAR and found evidence for landslides nearby. So this shaking associated with the Ayahos is very likely 
associated with earthquakes along the Seattle Fault Zone and potentially subsequent landslides. The, the people think that the Ayahos demolish a cliffside whenever someone would disturb him. And when you walk by these uh, spirit boulders, you're not supposed to look in the direction of the uh, Yaho because it, it would get angry and shake the ground, cause an earthquake, and potentially turn you to stone. Oh, I guess I did have um, one more quick example of a more specific story about the Ayahos, the Suquamish tribal story of Agate Passage, which is here just to the north of Bainbridge Island. And I've written out the story for you there in, in real short summary. The giant serpent lived in these waters when the Agate Passage was very small. A double-headed eagle flew over the pass that made the serpent angry, so they got in a great battle. The eagle eventually killed the serpent, exploded out of the water, flew away with the serpent's body, but behind him was left the wide pass. So this is the Suquamish explanation for the, the reason that Agate Passes widened. And this description, according to this same study by Ludwin and others about the Ayahus, could reflect permanent ground level damage, maybe from an earthquake in 900 CE that has been dated because that's the right sense of ground motion. This northern block of the fault is what dropped down and that would have widened the passage. So to wrap up here, I just want to sort of summarize what I think the importance here of merging Western science and what we can take away, especially from these last two examples. So those previous two examples are good examples of indigenous seismology, a term um, coined by yet another paper by Ludwin, but Thrush as well in 2007. These Pacific Northwest First Nations clearly observed and recorded seismological events for millennia, and this is encoded in their traditional narratives. And obviously seismic activity is an important component of their relationship with non-human entities. So the example of the spirit boulders and the Ayahus. They also connected this indigenous seismology to both Ill illness and healing. So if a person was ill or maybe the world, just their world as they saw it was ill, the occurrence of an earthquake could cause the healing of that illness. So Western science has really only recently caught up with respect to Cascadia, right? In the 60s is when we figured out that it's a, a, a subduction zone with the, um, the plate tectonic theory. And in the 70s, early 80s is when we really recognized it as seismologically active. But again, for millennia, the indigenous tribes have been encoding that fact within their geomets. So even though we credit ourselves with these discoveries, it's really more about we're figuring out the how now, right? Where they were already working on the why. And I think an inherent issue is that indigenous stories are perceived as primitive and they're very often dismissed and ignored. So colonialism back hundreds of years, right? Even in the early 1800s, these stories were being recorded but they weren't being recognized to contain the information that they have. Also, to be fair, they are difficult to work with. There's a lot of time compression involved in these kind of stories. You see myths throughout the world that, that describe time as 40 days or a week, you know, seven days is another number that pops in a lot. And so we can't really get those specific numbers. And also to be fair, there probably has been some loss of detail. I talked about those conservation principles, but Again, with the, the problem of colonialism and bringing, trying to entirely wipe out these cultures, certainly some of those stories were lost. But I think that these examples demonstrate that not only does indigenous knowledge support scientific arguments, it can also reveal geologic data that we haven't even uncovered yet. And I want to leave you with some thoughts about cultural and ethic or equity implications, um, I think it's important that we make sure we don't re replicate past inequities, right? That we use the knowledge in a way that will benefit those from who it is derived because that has not traditionally happened. Um, there's typically this sort of tension between what bureaucrats think of as expertise and what indigenous tribes think of as expertise, which is also compounded by the fact that Indigenous people see using their knowledge out of context as dangerous. And then lastly, many indigenous knowledge systems don't reconcile differences between animate and inanimate objects, as I showed you with the Ayahu's example. And of course, Western science wouldn't like that very much. 
So I'm going to leave you with this quote that I really enjoy by Linda Smith of the Maori tribe. And she says, indigenous peoples are deeply cynical about the capacity, motives, or methodologies of Western research. It told us things already known, suggested things that would not work, and made careers for people who already had jobs. So I think this balance of being mutually beneficial is really, it needs to be the focus of moving forward with this discipline. And actually, before I really stop talking, I just want to make a couple of acknowledgements. Um, again, giving a nod to Dorothy Vitaliano. Um, I couldn't have, have devised this course without building on the shoulders of giants, as it were. I also want to acknowledge Phoebe Thompson. I hope she made it into the audience. She is a Pomona graduate just this past year. Um, and she did a thesis on classics, the overlap of classics and geology, in fact, on the Oracle of Delphi and Heropolis and the gaseous vent theory. But she also attended every single one of my geomythology courses, even though she had started her graduate studies at Cambridge because of an interest and basically became my informal TA while I was um, teasing out the course, provided me with a lot of resources that were great starting points. So thanks, Phoebe. And then lastly, um, Pomona College supported me with a wig teaching innovation grant, which really helped me focus a lot of my efforts this summer on researching and digging into this topic. So I will happily do my best to answer any questions you might have at this point.